Good afternoon. This is Chuck Shaden, and we've opened our hall closet today for some good sounds on our Those Were the Days. We're talking about weather, and to help us out, we have in our plush WLTD Studio B, Harry Volkman, NBC's resident weatherman. Harry, welcome aboard. Chuck, it's great to be here. I can tell that you're a prosper station because both lights work up there on the wall. <laughs> That's right. You mean an NBC, only one of those Why, two lights? Why, you never know that maybe just one light working on each camera. And you don't know that means you're half on or whether you're half off as usual. Mm, well, you <laughs> <laughs> How much uh, uh, time has gone by since you first uh, entered the Chicago area? Well, in August, it will be 14 years since 14? I came here, uh -huh. 1959. And you came uh, specifically to do the weather at NBC? Yes. I don't know if it was getting out of control under Clint Ewell, but uh, they did need to have someone to take his place. He was leaving. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And um, I came in for an audition in June, but it wasn't until August that I got the word that they wanted me to come in. Uh -huh. Where did you come from? I was working in Oklahoma City, Chuck, uh, down at... Uh, KWTV, that was a uh, CBS affiliate, now, although I had been with an NBC station in Oklahoma City, and um, that was a great move for me when I came to Chicago, believe me. I can imagine. Now, you're not from Oklahoma City originally, no, but you're from the east someplace. That's right. Uh, I came from the uh, east uh, part right around Boston, a suburb that not too many people have heard of called Somerville. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somerville, we used to say. Somerville. Uh, you don't have a... Um, Boston Well, accent. I used to. I, uh, uh -huh. I was with a fellow here the other day who uh, was from Arlington, and as soon as we started conversing, we dropped the R's automatically. <laughs> like we go back to the native tongue uh -huh. or something. <laughs> what about uh, uh, the weather in Chicago uh, as opposed to the weather in Boston or Oklahoma City? Is it is it similar, really? Well, uh, I understand that the weather in Chicago has been opposed to the weather in Boston for many years. And, uh, <laughs> So as a result, when the White Sox and the Red Sox play, somebody always wins and somebody always loses. No, uh, <laughs> there is a, a lot of similarity, really, in the weather. In other words, Chicago is more like the Boston weather I grew mm -hmm. up with, a lot more so than it was like the Oklahoma weather that I worked with. Uh, you see, basically the northern states east of the Rockies have changeable weather in the four seasons. And what happens in Chicago one day oftentimes will be in Boston within, say, 36 to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you really had the weather. It's a little greater extreme here. In other words, when it gets hotter in the summer, it's a little hotter here, and it gets a little colder because Boston is affected by the Atlantic. That moderates the climate a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, now, we had some uh, interesting weather in the Chicago area this morning. Well, I should say. Uh, what happened? I think the atmosphere just got this too is, much this is moisture. For free, folks. How we about that? For free. Oh no! This, uh, who told you that? Uh oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why, George? Anyway, no. The uh, the the thunderstorms were expected, but not this early. But the atmosphere just got so charged, I think, with moisture and heat so early, it just couldn't hold it any longer, and it just really let it go. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just a big explosion of thunderstorms, and the uh, you can tell by those mammatus clouds out there, I suppose some of the folks that can see out a window now in some parts of the city can still see those rounded clouds that are gray and hanging downward. That's a sign of great turbulence of hail, of strong winds and such things as that, mm -hmm. attendant with severe thunderstorms. We had the same thing last weekend, Chuck, when I was up in Cape Cod, and they were having these races up at Marble Head, which is a famous place for sailing races mm -hmm. in summer, mm -hmm. and more than a 100 boats were overturned in a severe squall. And I note that they have a lot of boat races scheduled for Lake Michigan this next week, and uh, I hope we don't get thunderstorms like this because there'll be a lot of people dumped into the drink there. Yeah. It's uh, seemed to have stopped now, mostly yes, uh, on the North Shore here. I know it's a lot of blue sky to the west. Yeah. And that's you a think good we'll sign. have a sunny period now for the rest of the afternoon? Or well, something? it'll probably build up again. It will. You know, we'll get clear, and then we'll cloud up into the thunderstorm again. That's probably what'll happen. Do you add uh, to your knowledge uh, any special signs from a, a corn or a, oh, yes. a bone in the... Well, I'm waiting for uh, the corn to grow now, you know. It's, <laughs> it's been a little late. Well, at least it's clear skies, according to Harry Goldman. Don't know why they're 
there's no sun up in the sky, stormy weather, since my gal and I ain't together, keeps raining all the time, life is bad. Get my poor self together. I'm weary all the time, the time. So weary all the time. When she went away, the blues walked in and met me. If she stays away, old rocking chair will get me. All I do is pray the Lord above will let me walk in the sun once more. Can't go on. Raining all the time Keeps raining all the Tony Martin, not Harry Volkman, though I think perhaps Harry Volkman could have uh, done a good version of that. Do you think so? <laughs> I'd rather you're, doubt uh, that. You're quite a singer. You're in the uh, choir out at uh, the Glenview United Methodist Church in Glenview, and uh, I think there was an infamous appearance by Harry Volkman on the, uh, was it the local Emmys one year? Two years. Two years ago? How about For that? two years you did it. 1967 and 1970. I tell you, that 67 appearance was something that um, <laughs> we'd put that on the Emmy show, and uh, we I forget the hotel ballroom that we were all in, and the uh, the room was darkened. Mm -hmm. And my part on the show was done in silhouette first, and I walked out of the shadows uh, singing Soon It's Gonna Rain on a clear day you can see forever, and uh, not raindrops because that wasn't until the next time. That hadn't even been written then. But uh, the audience reaction was great <laughs> because they wanted who that was coming out to sing. And then when I started to sing, they still couldn't see anything but a silhouette. And uh, when they saw it was I, uh, you know, instead of doing a weather report, there was the shock effect. <laughs> you know, believe it or not, there were three guys there waiting afterwards, Chuck, that wanted me to sign a contract to go to Las Vegas. <laughs> really? Because they wanted me to gamble away some of my money. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think they wanted me to try something. But I was, um, I don't know, I wasn't ready to grab at anything of that nature. I've always thought of singing as an avocation. And 
I, you know, I do it like you say in church occasionally, and maybe on some summer program. I'm out in the uh, park, like out in Elmhurst, mm-hmm. under the stars, every now and then in, in June. But uh, I don't have that feeling that I was born to be a singer, really. You wouldn't be the singing Sam of the 70s then, right? Can we say Barbersaw Man? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one, one morning uh, we played on our uh, Hall Closet program, uh, program, a disc jockey program that was produced for the guys overseas by G.I. Jill. It was called G.I. Oh, Jive. Yes. And I remember uh, you called in one morning and said, Hey, I remember hearing this program yes. when I was in the service. Yes, we were sailing out of mm-hmm. Boston and... Um, it was fairly lonely because we were the only ship, and uh, we, uh, they told us, well, you'll be on a convoy going to Europe because uh, you'll need protection. And all of a sudden, we, the first day we have a, a dirigible, a, uh, an airship, flying mm-hmm. over us. Mm-hmm. But at sundown, that airship went back to Quonset Point or something, and we were left all alone in what we thought. So they, well, they finally reassured us that we were fast enough and could zigzag enough that the torpedoes couldn't hit us. But... <laughs> we did have the radio come on that night, and uh, that really made us feel more secure to know that stateside radio uh, with G.I. Jill and Fred McMurray mm-hmm, mm-hmm. was going to be entertaining us all the way across on that lonesome voyage. You know, was, was that, do you remember, was that, uh, <clears throat> they picked it up on the short wave then, huh? Or was I it had a feeling that they had on records the on the they, ship yeah, or something. Yeah. I never did ask or find out. No mm-hmm. one... That's knew. probably what they had, you know. The because it, it was yeah. the same volume and quality, mm-hmm. you know. It didn't sound like a fading station yeah, uh-huh. or anything like that. But, you know, when I see Fred McMurray, and uh, he's still doing commercials today uh-huh. with his hair dark, you know. Yeah, right. He looks like he hasn't aged in 30 years or so. <laughs> but. Well, now, you, you uh, were mentioning before, while we were tuning into uh, Tony Martin and the stormy weather thing, you were mentioning about radio and how much you enjoyed uh the radio when you were uh, a youngster listening to radio and that it may have had some effect on your life. Oh, it was tremendous. Uh, I owe so much of my career and uh, a lot of my life and I suppose even thoughts today to the past. Um, I suppose a little bit too much I may live there because I think I had a palmist or some uh, person with ESP tell me one day that they thought that I lived a little bit in the past, you know, that it was very evident in something they saw in me. But I do recall listening every night in my bedside radio. And in Boston, I would listen oftentimes to Chicago radio. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I got a kick out of tuning in like uh, 890, where one night it would be WENR, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and another night WLS, and there were several of them around the country like that. They shared the frequency. Yes. Right. And it was uh, such a thrill just to be able to pull in stations like that from great distances. Were you on in those days, Chuck? This was about 19... Uh, 35 to 1940. I was on. I was on the carpet in front of our radio at home uh, (laughs) listening to the same sounds. (laughs) We've got some engineers still down at the Mart who Mm -hmm. were there in those days. Of course, they're gradually retiring more and more all the time. You have a a man who's a lighting man now. He was a um, uh, sound engineer, and he did some sound effects, I think, for Fibber McGee and Kurt Mitchell. That's right. He lives in Evanston. Yeah, right. right. Yes, he goes back, and also the fellow he worked with, Mm -hmm. Tom... Horan, I think is his name. They were both there in the early 30s. Mm-hmm. When uh, sound effects were all done, uh, you know, manually, yeah, they had these right. big shelves like you've got here with records. There were different sound effects in each little mm-hmm. cubicle. Mm-hmm. And I guess that they didn't think that they should use records. Well, they, they, they wanted to create them uh, immediately, right, as mm-hmm. they were doing it, and they would integrate it in right into the action. You know, the, the famous uh, hoof beats of yeah. the horses and... Uh, I, I even have a wind machine at home yes. that was made. Well, you know, uh, going back to those early days, in 1939 or 38, one Christmas morning, uh, here was this RCA sound effects kit that my mother got for me. And uh, it had the wind <laughs> machine on it uh-huh. and the cow, uh, you know, the thing where you turn it over and it goes, you know. <laughs> you ever seen one of those yeah, cow sound yeah, effects? Yeah. And then the, uh, the balloon, of course, naturally the one I liked was the wind machine. Mm-hmm. The balloon with the buckshot in it that made like thunder. Like that, you know, we didn't shake any big board or whatever it was. I don't know how that comes over this microphone. How did it sound, all right? <laughs> sounded like a weatherman making a sound with his voice. Mm. That's right. How about that? <laughs> anyway, uh, those sound effects, and then you, you take this little board with uh, nails on it, and you'd scratch it over a um, piece of glass, and it would make for break sounds. Mm-hmm. But uh, in 39... 
uh, for Christmas once again, I got this uh, wireless oscillator, which was the uh, radio station uh, that I first went on the air with when I was uh, 13 years old. <laughs> What were they call letters? What did you call it? W-H-A-B. H-A-B. See, that's... wonder where Barry, got that. Huh? Albert Volkman. And I used to write scripts, just like you've got here, you know, you've uh -huh. got copy. My brothers and I, we would write commercials. We would get the news out of the newspaper. We would get uh, drama books from the library mm -hmm. and then take parts and do plays. See, so this was the influence of the soap operas. Uh, my family all listened to the news and the weather. So we would make believe we were news and weathermen, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this was a tremendous uh, influence on me, and it, I enjoyed it more than anything else, more than baked beans on Saturday night, more than baseball or ice cream. And I decided that I wanted to grow up and do this kind of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to uh, keep a diary. In fact, I've still got them, and I look at them occasionally. And I occasionally like today before I came here I looked back to see if there was any mention on June 16th of anything significant and I find that uh, I mentioned there frequently uh, that I listened to the radio you know mm -hmm. this was a big mm -hmm. thing in my life you know <laughs> listening to the radio enough to put it in the diary and, along with the weather and uh, things of that nature and uh, such things as gangbusters I would mention that I had listened to mm -hmm. and uh, all sorts of shows like that Radio was great because it uh, it gave uh, you the opportunity to use your imagination, because yes, very you see, much so. the the voices and the uh, the sound effects set the scene for you. But you were right there; you were in it. Mm -hmm. You had to uh, create the pictures and dress the actors. I've said this many times before. You you provided the most essential ingredient with radio. Well, I I felt that uh, something like the Lux Radio Theater was really classy radio mm -hmm, in those mm -hmm. days. And to listen to Cecil B. DeMille come on there each week and announce who was going to be on next week, and you'd hear the audience all moan and, oh, Clark Gable's going to be yeah. on next week, you know, <laughs> and all that. But I still, even today, Chuck, as I was then, I was not uh, so much fascinated by that as I was just the idea of the... Uh, news elements of radio, mm -hmm. the timeliness, you know, like the news covering certain events like the crash of, the, what, the Hindenburg mm -hmm. in, at Lakehurst, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then, of course, right up through the the World War. One of the things that impressed me the most, is this was just three weeks before I was drafted, it was D-Day, and waking up in the morning to hear that eyewitness account of the landing in Normandy, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. was fantastic. That was to radio uh, then what uh, these on-the-spot things are with television today, I guess. You know, we found, we found a copy of that, uh, one of those D-Day reports uh, in our hall closet, and we played it, hmm. uh, I think, on, on June the 6th. It was a, right? uh, a really an interesting thing. It was a, a recording, or a it was a recording of the broadcast that was made aboard one of the ships at the landing, and you could hear mm -hmm. the... You know the the bombs and the gunshots and the airplanes and uh, it was it was it was fantastic. It was a, a very moving. I think we had it run around seven or eight minutes or so. It was really really interesting. Well, turning on the radio that mm -hmm. morning, of course, uh, by the time the invasion had, when it took place, of course, it was still the early hours mm -hmm. of the morning here in the United States. But I woke up to that sound, and just that kind of sound of a remote broadcast and battling and everything, it just hit me, this had to be it, this mm -hmm. must be the invasion today, you know, because mm -hmm. it was expected for quite some time. But anyway, that, um, all those things about radio, I listened to it morning, noon, and night, the soap operas, I would go visit radio stations, and uh, who do you think I went to see, of course, was the local weatherman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have dreams of being the... Uh Radio weatherman or a... Uh, well, oh, I yes, I, I dreamed about, about being uh, that. In fact, I would uh, uh, go in sometimes and even help this one weatherman that was on the air in Boston. Uh -huh. His name was Rideout. And uh, he went on the air in 1926 and stayed on until only just about a few years ago. And that man was a pioneer in New England broadcasting and weather, and he was the probably one of the biggest influences on my uh -huh. life uh -huh. of, towards going into this business. Now, radio... Um really didn't provide the opportunity, maybe I'm wrong, but I would suspect that radio didn't provide the opportunity for a weatherman as much as television did with the visuals and all of that other thing. I don't really remember a, ever hearing a weather forecaster or a meteorologist on radio doing the weather. I would hear it at the end of a newscast. Well, there weren't too many 
outside of the New England area, as far mm -hmm. as I know. There was one person here, I understand, back in the early days on WLS, people have told mm -hmm. me, that was uh, quite popular. Now, this is not WLS as today's popular, mm -hmm. John Coleman I'm talking about, yeah. but uh, there was some fellow who did a pretty good job on uh, radio back about 30 years ago. Maybe some of your listeners would well, know who that Julian was. Well, Julian Bentley used to be the popular WLS newsman. Uh -huh. And uh, and they had John Holtman, and I'm trying to think of some of the other... Uh, John WLS. was on NBC when I went there, on WMAQ. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. he, yeah, later on. Well, John Holtman may have been... Well, he was with w, uh, WLS, Cy Harris... Cy Harris was a man on LS for a long Not time. Not Sidney Harris. Not Sidney Harris. No, <laughs> Cy Harris. And, uh, but uh, I, I don't remember that that they had someone specifically who came in and did the weather. You know. No, there was a, in the early days of television mm -hmm. in Boston in the late 40s an MIT professor, fellow from New Zealand, who uh, used to come on the TV and draw a map, and he was my inspiration for television. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I went and visited him, and he told me that he used to write his temperatures in a light red so the audience couldn't see it, but he could, and he would trace over that. And I remember saying to myself, if ever I get on, I'm not going to jip the people like that. <laughs> I'm not going to copy. I'm going to memorize it uh -huh. and write it down directly. Now, do you do that now, or do you jip the people? Well, I, when I started, <laughs> I used to draw everything on the air. In other words, I would go on with a blank map. Uh -huh. Now, it has gone to that other extreme, mm -hmm. but it's because of a new directive from the management that, you know, the stuff will all be pre-prepared. Mm -hmm. So I have really less to do in about the last two months uh, on the air, except just point to and say, look at this and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff, you know. Now, actually, you're it's pointing to nothing yourself, right? And you're watching it on the monitor? Is that your opinion? <laughs> <of what laughs> <I'm pointing to? laughs> no, but I mean, isn't it done with, with the camera, right? No, it's not like the chroma key or... Mm -hmm. um, what we used to have, like, for example, you uh, try to let the audience think you're looking at it when really you're watching a monitor. Mm -hmm. No, we have the screen right beside us, and I'm looking at the same thing that they're looking oh, at. Oh, you actually, what they flash on there, you yeah, actually Yeah, except when we run the satellite loop, oh, that uh -huh. is, and I haven't been doing that quite so much lately because I'm so far away from it, I can't uh -huh. point to it, so I've been using stills. Uh, now, that is right beside me. The only thing is, it has to be... Uh, I have to be in the light, and it has to be out of the light, because mm -hmm. if the light that's on me is thrown on that, it'll wash it out. So there have to be many technical things set just right in order to portray the weather as it is now with our new system. It's mm -hmm. called Selematic. Selematic. It's come a long way since those early days yeah. of uh, radio. I remember. Now, let's see. The, the NBC weatherman went, uh, the first one, I believe, was Clint Ewell. Yes. And then it was Harry Volkman. And then you left NBC for a while, and then you pop back at NBC, right? Yeah, I go to these schools, Chuck, and they say, well, how come you went to uh, WGN? I uh -huh. said, I wanted to get Bozo tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Did uh, you get any? <laughs> yes, I can just think you can go in there, and when you work there, you can walk in every day in, into this That's right. room and see Bozo. And otherwise, you have to wait five years for tickets. It's no mm. wonder that these expectant mothers, they, they write in. Uh, as soon as they find out, they're going to be a mother and say, I'd like to have tickets because five years from now, my unborn child will be five years old, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Harry, what about, uh, we were talking about radio, and we don't want to forget, we've got a whole closet filled with good radio sounds today, and we've got a Fibber McGee and Molly program coming up next. Do you remember listening to Fibber and Molly? Oh, do I Johnson's ever. Johnson's Wax program? It came right from the Merchandise Mart where I work today. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And those fellows, Mitchell and Haran, used to do a lot of the sound effects on that show. Well, we're going to hear some sound effects now. This program is... Uh, Fibber and Molly left the Chicago area in about 39 when they went to um, mm -hmm. uh, Hollywood. But we have a Fibber and Molly show from 1942. This is January 27th of 1942. And uh, I think uh, we'll just pull up a chair next to the good old radio and tune in to part one of Fibber, McGee, and Molly. The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber, McGee, and Molly. Makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coats present Fibber McGee and Bali, written by Don Quinn, with songs by the King's Men and music by Billy Mills. The show opens with Free For All. The 
kitchen is such an important room in the house, you can't blame a woman for wanting to make it cheerful and convenient. In the first place, it's her workroom, where she spends a good many hours. Also, it's a room where both neighbors and family like to visit. Why shouldn't it be a pleasant room with colorful curtains, convenient cabinets, and a beautiful, easy-to-keep-clean floor? That, of course, is where Johnson's Glow Coat comes in. A floor that's kept sparkling with Glow Coat does wonders for your kitchen, keeps it clean and bright with a minimum of work. And don't forget that the regular use of Johnson's self-polishing Glow Coat makes your linoleum last from five to ten times longer. Now, you know, of course, that Glow Coat needs no rubbing or buffing. It's self-polishing. Glow Coat gives a floor lasting luster, has a flexible film that wears evenly and smoothly without chipping. And Glow Coat is economical because a little goes a long way. But for real, Glow Coat results don't be satisfied with anything but the original Johnson self-polishing Glow Coat with the familiar red and yellow label. Buy some tomorrow. First blizzard in 76 years has hit Wistful Vista. Snow has drifted up to the second floor windows in some places. And this is one of the places, the home of Fibber McGee and Molly. Well, it certainly is nice to stay home by a warm fire tonight, isn't it, dearie? I'll say. Ain't a fit night out for a man or Hitler. <laughs> It must be terribly cold out. Cold? Why, when I come home tonight, that snowman in front of Toops's was blowing on his fingers. <laughs> Say, what's the exact temperature? Stick your head out the door and see what the thermometer on the porch says. Oh, no. I wouldn't protrude my puss out those portals tonight for all the retreads in Detroit. <laughs> no, sir. Well, then turn on the radio. It's just time for the weather report. Oh, say, it is at that. I wonder just how cold it is. Terribly. Thanks. <laughs> Well, at least we're comfortable and warm here. You want to play a game of rummy, dearie? No, I got a lot of stuff to do. Never have a better chance to do them, too, either. Just what have you got to do? Oh, I got to paste my defense stamps in my book and sort out my trout flies and write a letter to Aunt Sarah thanking her for my Christmas presents. She didn't send you any Christmas presents. Well, I'm in a sarcastic mood. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're going to be busy, McGee. Maybe I can finish knitting this, uh, this, uh... This what? I wish I knew. <laughs> I'm not much of a knitter yet. <laughs> now you're a swell needle pointer. I know, but the Army has some silly objections to needlepoint sweaters. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe if I'd... Uh... My gosh, there's somebody at the door. You know, that's what I love about you, McGee. You grasp things so quickly. <laughs> well, let them in. They'll freeze to death out there. Okay, but if it's a good humor man, he ain't using good judgment. Hey, good evening. I'm Mr. George Melvin. Come in. Come in. Come in. Wind goes through you like a collector from the Internal Revenue. <laughs> What'd you say your name was, bud? Uh, Spelvin, George Spelvin. You're Mr. McGee? That I am, that I am indeed. And this is my wife, Molly. Molly, Mr. Spelvin. Oh, how do you do, I'm sure. Delighted, madam. Why, it's nice and cozy in here. Don't tell me you're knitting on a tiny garment. Congratulations. When is the happy event? Huh? It isn't a tiny garment. It's a sweater for a soldier. Yeah. And if I don't stop dropping stitches, it won't be a happy event either. <laughs> Have a chair, Mr. Spellbound. Uh, Spellbound, and thank you. But first, I'd better drop this overcoat and these one over to the hall. McGee. Hmm? Who is he? I don't know. But I wouldn't turn a dog away on a night like this. And he looks kind of like an old hound I used to have. When I... Well, well, well. Ha have a chair, Spelvin, old man. Thank you, thank you. A nice place you have here, Mrs. McGee. Thank you. We like it. We have to. We own it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I imagine you'll be seeing a great deal of it for the next few days. You won't be able to get downtown to a restaurant till this storm is over. Well, so what? Home is where the heartburn is, I always says. <laughs> Did you want to see me about something, Spelman? What? Oh, oh, yes. Uh, Mr. McGee, I have a special message to you from the governor. Heavenly days from the governor. Maybe you've got an appointment, dearie. Well, it's about time. 
I volunteered for everything from air raid warden to mixing macaroons for Marines. <laughs> What did the governor say, Spelvin? Well, first, Mr. McGee, may I ask if you have a car? Every time I see it, I ask myself the same thing. <laughs> sure, I got a car, bud. Tip-top condition, too. You're not kidding, McGee. That top tips under any condition. <laughs> well, it really doesn't matter as long as it runs. Oh, it runs. That car will do 55 in second gear, Spelvin. And 30 in high. <laughs> oh, now, Molly, you're giving George here entirely wrong impression. <laughs> you see, George... You don't mind if I call you George, do you? Oh, not at all. Glad to have you. Fine. You see, Spelvin, before we were married, <laughs> my wife used to go with a guy that owned a Stutz Bearcat, and she never got over Never the mind ad- me, McGee. Huh? What does the governor say? Yeah, what did he say, Spelvin? Well, the fact is, McGee, it's of the utmost importance that you... Oh, dear. Now who? You answered, McGee. I'm right in the middle of a mistake in my knitting. Okay. Excuse me a minute, George. Oh, certainly. I suppose somebody wants me to tie some hot coffee around my neck and go rescue their St. Bernard. <laughs> It's the old timer, Molly. Okay, Johnny. Uh, just for a minute. Hello there, daughter. What you doing? <laughs> Knitting for Britain or crocheting for the main land? <laughs> we can't stand that applause, can we? Oh, good evening, Mr. Old Timer. May I introduce you to Mr. Spelvin? Mr. Spelvin, this is uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, say, what is your name anyway, Mr. Old Timer? Hey, I don't believe I ever heard it either. Just call me Old Timer, kids. Names don't matter. It's character that counts. As long as the fire's crew blue, honest, straightforward, and backward. Oh, don't be so coy. <laughs> What's your name? Come on, old timer. After all, it couldn't be worse than Fibber. Uh, maybe not, Johnny, but I'm more sensitive than you are. <laughs> won't you tell us? Nope. Just tell me. Nope. Whisper to my ear. I won't tell anybody. Uh, promise? I promise. Okay. <laughs> oh, heavenly days, it couldn't be. Uh, it is, though. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> uh, Mr. Spelvin, uh, this is the old timer. How do you do, sir? Well, hello, son. Sorry to butt in like this, kids. Just wanted to know if I could borrow a hot poker. A hot poker? No, I'm sorry, old timer. Our poker's busted. What on earth did you want that for? Oh, me and my girlfriend. Your girlfriend? No, my girlfriend. Francis. Oh. We were playing in the snow along the street here, diving into snow drifts. And all of a sudden, I missed Fran. Must have knocked herself out in a fire hydrant or something. <laughs> anyway, she's under a drift someplace along here, and I was going to jab around with a hot poker. <laughs> oh, well. Guess I can use a sharp stick. See you later, kids. Good night, Mr. Tailspin. <laughs>
That's the first portion of Fibber McGee and Molly from January 27th of 1942. This is Chuck Shaden on Those Were the Days from WLTD 1590 on your good old radio. We're having a program this afternoon built around fair weather on the air. We have lots of fair weather, good listening sounds, uh, bringing back the golden days of radio and little things that have to do with weather. And we have a, a weather expert in our studio this afternoon. Harry Volkman has joined us. And as a matter of fact, we have a real honest-to-goodness uh, weather note, right? And we're going to let Harry handle okay, it for I, us. If NBC will give me permission, I'll read this over here. Right now we have this sage warning for the lakefront, Chuck. Uh, a sudden rise and fall of water levels of about three feet is possible this afternoon from about 2.30 to 4 o'clock Chicago time. This water surge, known as a seish, is expected to develop due to the passage of the line of thunderstorms across Chicago earlier this afternoon. Those are now across the lake over into northern Indiana. So we could get a rise and fall of about 3 feet on that lakefront between 2.30 and 4 this afternoon. This is a seish warning for the Chicago lakefront issued by the National Weather Service just a few minutes ago. Thank you very much. Can you imagine someone just flipping around on the <coughs> dial now, <clears throat> and they come up on 1590, and they hear Harry Volkman giving the sage warning, and they say, what is what is MAQ doing way down there? <laughs> I'll tell you what. For probably equal, uh, if uh, Irv Kupsnick gets a hold of this, he'll say, well, uh, I see they didn't renew his contract. <laughs> <laughs> we'll renew it. We'll take it. As a matter of fact, for equal time, if you want, I'll come over and play a Fibber McGee and Molly show on NBC. Very good. <laughs> Did you hear that very long weather report on that Fibber McGee yeah. show? Oh, wasn't that great? <laughs> in, in the opening there, he said, wonder how's the weather, and what did he say? Terribly. Terribly. <laughs> how, how cold it is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's shorter than what I give. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get back to Fibber and Molly in just a second. Fun and adventure await boys and girls 7 to 14 at the exciting Hastings YMCA co-ed camp in Lake Villa. 180 beautifully wooded acres across the shores of Hastings Lake, just 45 miles northwest of Chicago. Parents, your youngsters will thrill to the full program of activities offered by Hastings, one of Chicagoland's finest resident camps. They'll enjoy swimming, horseback riding, water skiing, sailing, every kind of outdoor sport, plus a balanced diet modern, completely weatherproof housing, and an experienced staff of professional YMCA counselors, specially trained to provide an exciting summertime experience for your child. Hastings YMCA Co-Ed Camp offers four two-week periods beginning July 1st. For registration information and surprisingly low camp fees, call 356-7567 or drop a line to the Hastings YMCA Co-Ed Summer Camp, Route 2, Lake Villa, 600 Four six. That's three five six, seven five, six seven. Harry Volkman, did you go to summer camp when you were a youngster? Not till Uncle Sam took me. <laughs> I stayed around the uh, the sidewalks and the ghettos of the inner city of the greater Boston area. The teeming metropolis. They used to take pictures mm -hmm. of me and put it in the paper and say, "Send this boy to camp." <laughs> yeah. Funny Uncle Sam did. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first summer camp experience too, when I went to uh, uh, Fort Leonard Wood. Where did you Heaven's go? Sake. My brother-in-law was down there. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I went to Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, no, really, uh, some of those summers I did either go to Cape Cod or up to New Hampshire. You know, some years my mother said we ought to go down to the beach, and other years we ought to go up to the mountains. Mm -hmm. And I really did enjoy that. We used to go on, in the summertime, we used to go to the islands a lot. We went to Blue Island and Stony Island. <laughs> and once How about we, Coney Island? No, right? not the Coney, Rock Island, maybe. <laughs> Okay, well, if you can come up with a bad one, so can I, all right? That's all Let's right. say we listen to some more of Fibber and Molly. Won't you have another cup of coffee before you and McGee start talking business, Mr. Spelvin? Uh, thanks, I believe I will. Delicious coffee, Mrs. McGee. I'm glad you like it. I make it from a recipe I got from McGee's half-sister, Beth. What do you mean, half-sister? She's my sister. Not since she worked for that magician and he taught her in two. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot that. Just a family <laughs> joke, Spell. We always kid Bessie about wanting to go on the stage. Oh, is that so? <laughs> yeah. You know, I had a younger brother always wanted to go on the stage. Finally made it, too. Good for him. Yes, he was out in Desert Springs, Arizona once, and he wanted to go to Dry Gulch, New Mexico, but the trains weren't running, so <laughs> he went on the stage. <laughs> uh, well, let's get down to business, Selvin. <laughs> As long as you represent the governor, suppose you tell me just exactly what he wants me to... Well, for goodness sake, more orphans of the storm. See who it is, McGee. Okay, excuse me a minute, Spelvin, while I see what no good this ill wind is blowing us. Oh, of course. Oh, 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 oh,
Come on in, Uppy. Oh, how do you do, Abigail? May I present Mr. Spelvin, Mr. Spelvin, Mrs. Uppington? Oh, how do you do? Not the Mrs. Uppington, through whose window someone threw a rock. <laughs> the very same, Spelvin, the very same. <laughs> will you have a cup of coffee, Abigail? You look awfully cold. Oh, thank you, I will, my dear, and I am cold. In fact, I'm quite numb. That's what I was telling Molly just this morning, Uppy. I says that Uppington frail is just about the... McGee! Se- <laughs> he said numb. Huh? Oh, I... Hey, what are you doing out on a night like this, Uppy? This kind of weather's only good for one thing. To keep the Germans rushing back from the Russian front. <laughs> Did you get it, folks? I says to keep... Ain't funny, McGee. <laughs> I thought it was rather amusing, Mrs. McGee. Oh, thanks, Bell. Have a cigar? Oh, thanks. I have one. You got two? Thanks. <laughs> uh, answering your question, Mr. McGee, I had Mrs. Peavy out for a walk. She adores the snow, you know. Is Peavy your daughter, Mrs. Uppington? Peavy is a Pekingese, Mr. Spelvin. How interesting. I'd love to meet her. Chinese girls are so intelligent, I say. <laughs> I'd love to discuss the situation. Peepee in... is a dog, Spelvin, and she ain't interested in the foreign situation. As I was saying, it was so blustery and so cold outside, I was frightfully afraid of being lost in the storm. And yours was the only light I could see for simply blocks, my dear. So I struggled through the drifts and finally succeeded in forcing my way through the snow to your front door. But where's Peepee? Oh, I took her home first. <laughs> Well, sit down and take a load off your eye millers, Uppy. <laughs> Mr. Spelvin here was just about to give me a message from the governor. As a matter of fact, I... What we need is a doorman. Does anybody here know any unemployed Eskimos? <laughs> well, go see who it is, McGee. Okay, but... All right, all right, all right. Come on in, Buck. Come on in. Shut the door. Good oh, boy. Oh, gee. Thanks, Fibber. My hands were so cold I couldn't find the doorbell. I had to hammer with my elbows. Haven't you got sense enough to stay home on a night like this, Harlow? Well, my conscience was bothering me, Fibber. I just ran across a book I borrowed from you a long time ago. Here. Oh, thanks. What is it? Oh, If Winter Comes. <laughs> you sure this is mine? Yep. I borrowed it in 1925. Huh. Hey, is that coffee I smell? It is, and you do. <laughs> Come on in, Harlan, and cross your eyebrows. Hello, Mr. Wilcox. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Wilcox? Hello, Mrs. Uppington. Harlow, this is Mr. George Spelvin. Spell the old man, this is Harlow Wilcox. Your linoleum's best friend and severest critic. I'm glad to know you, Mr. Wilcox. Well, this is a coincidence, Mr. Spelvin. I was demonstrating Johnson's self-polishing glow coat to a Mrs. Spelvin yesterday afternoon. Showing her how easy it was to apply, how quickly it dried to a beautiful polish how the easier homework would take years off her life and put them on the life of the linoleum. Let me see. No, it wasn't Mrs. Spelvin either. It was Mrs. Woods. Or, no, Crawford, that was it. Mrs. Crawford. Uh, no relation, I suppose. Uh, tall, dark woman with a mole on her arm? No, short and stout with a poodle on her lap. <laughs> no relation, I guess. Oh, speaking of poodles, Mr. Wilcox, I hated to take Mr. Peepy out tonight. Well, there's nothing like a dog. There's nothing like Uppy's dog. I'll go that far with you. (laughs) There ain't even another dog like her dog. Yeah, I had a dog once. Ah, man's best friend, I always say. Just like Johnson's glow coat is a woman's best friend because it saves so much time and effort. Heavenly days, Mr. Wilcox. Can't you forget Johnson's glow coat for one minute? I don't know. I never tried. (laughs) As I was saying, I had a dog once. I did, too. Uh, part Springer Spaniel on his mother's side and the smartest dog I ever knew on his father's side. <laughs> Smarter than a human being. Oh, now, McGee. Well, he was. Every Sunday morning, he'd go out on the porch and look both ways up and down the street. Then he'd kind of shake his little head and come back in the house. Every Sunday morning for 11 years, he did that. Well, what was he looking for? We never knew. <laughs> He knew, but we didn't. (laughs) So he was smarter than us. I'll have another cup of coffee, too, Molly. As I was going to say, I had a dog once. That mud of George's is going to die of old age before he gets it into the discussion. Excuse me while I see who's at the door. Oh, hi, the trivia. Shut the door. Come on in. Thank you, McGee. Glad you dropped in, the trivia. The conversation around here was going to the dogs. (laughs) 
Hey, everybody, here's Mayor Latrivia. Hello, Hello, Mayor. Mayor. I don't believe you know Mr. Spelvin, Your Honor. Mr. Spelvin, this is Mayor Latrivia. Yeah, I had a dog What? Oh, excuse me. I'm glad to meet you, Your Honor. How do you do? Are you a resident of our fair city, Mr. Spelvin? No, he don't vote here, Latrivia, so you can let go of his hand now. Uh, Mr. Spelvin represents the governor, Mr. Mayor. Oh, he does? Well, 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 well. I see where Mr. Spelvin and I can spend a profitable few minutes together. Uh, uh, we can have, have a, a cup of coffee, Mr. Mayor? Uh, thank you, and an egg sandwich. <laughs> I, uh, I just stopped in to tell you, McGee, that a complaint has reached my ears. I had the same thing last summer, Latrivia. Started in my neck and reached my ears in two days. The doctor says it was just a temper... Mr. McGee, please. What? I was about to say that I have received a complaint from the street commissioner that you have been remiss in the matter of snow removal from your front sidewalk. Oh, well, thanks for warning me, Latrivia. It's a funny thing, too. I, I really enjoy shoveling snow. You do? You do? I surely do. I'd rather hear the frosty clang of a snow shovel on a sidewalk than the finest symphony music in the world. To feel the red blood coursing through my veins as I swing that shovel to and fro. That marvelous glow that comes from exercising in the cold winter air. The sharp tang of the wind on my cheeks as my muscles respond to the healthy rhythm. And what an appetite I get. Sleep like a baby. Oh, I love the feeling of a snow. Hold it, McGee. Where are you going, Mr. Mayor? I'm going to shovel your walk off for you. I haven't felt like that in years. <laughs> There's the snow shovel. Snow shovel's right in here, Latrivia. Oh. Where, McGee? Right here in the hall closet. Got to straighten out that closet one of these days. The King's Men sing K. Ranchero. A K. Ranchero, a caballero, can always find someone to pet. A senorita, a pita pita, her other loves will soon forget. If he's insistent and she's not distant, the senorita will confess. Those are the King's Men on the Fibber, McGee, and Molly program. Fibber and Molly in a blizzard back in January of 1942. I wonder if that was predicted, Chuck. Uh, if uh, that weatherman who was on the uh, <laughs> on their radio there before would have predicted it. You didn't that know. show out of Hollywood at that time? I, I never mm. knew it snowed out there like that. Uh, but that's the beauty of the magic yeah, of radio. That's right. Surely mm. they Did you? sing White Christmas out of Hollywood and all that. I oh, sure. Did you, uh, do you have, hey, I want to ask you, do you ever have a, a Model T? Model T? A Model T? No. Uh, did you ever? My first car was a 40 Chevy. A 40 Chevy? Uh-huh. Do you have it anymore? No. No, you don't have it. If you had it now, you'd probably get a good deal if you traded it in with the Nelson Hirschberg Ford. 
There was, oh really? Okay. <laughs> that is known as Q for commercial. Switch on, there okay. goes another ship. <laughs> Maybe you recall World War II gas rationing with the little A and B stickers you used to have to display on your windshield. Maybe that's coming again. Well, if you have some of those memories, uh, Ralph Hirschberg of Nelson Hirschberg Ford has some of those memories too. Memories that roll back to 1931 when he and Norm Nelson first started selling Fords on Irving Park Road. Today, Ralph and Jurgen and all the folks at Nelson Hirschberg remember one other thing, that during all those years, the Ford owner who comes again to get his new Ford from Nelson Hirschberg is the Ford owner who's been treated with old-fashioned respect and courtesy. Not only when he buys that new Ford, but while he owns it, too. Thousands of Ford owners come back again and again to do business with Nelson Hirschberg, one of Chicagoland's oldest, most respected Ford dealers. Find out for yourself. Get your new Ford from an old-fashioned dealer. Visit Nelson Hirschberg Ford, 5133 Irving Park Road, five blocks west of Cicero, at Laramie. You're tuned to WLTD 1590 in Evanston. This is Chuck Shaden, along with Harry Volkman today on our Those Were the Days program. We're talking about weather and uh, radio and listening to the sounds of uh, blizzards and snow and rain and all kinds of things. We have our, our stuff. Let's, let's hear a little bit. <laughs> Come on, that was a little sound. <laughs> oh, it's getting frostbitten <laughs> here. <laughs> oh, it's a bitter night, Holmes. You'd better close the door. <clears throat> Oh, we even got a door there, too. That's right. That was one of the uh, things with uh, Sherlock Holmes all the time. Yeah, I saw Basil Rathbone on the late movie last night. Was that last night? Late? Yeah, I forget the name of the show it was. Uh Uh, It was around 2 o'clock it was on. (laughs) Well, see, you don't get off the air until around 10.30 or so, so you have to unwind a while, right? It takes a little while. Sometimes I don't ever wind down. You uh, contribute some weather forecasting to uh, the morning show on MAQ Radio, too. Occasionally, when Uh Howard Miller is at a loss for words. uh, Once every three years, why? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Howard does a pretty good job with the weather, but occasionally there are some things Mm -hmm. happen where I figure, you know, that I should add some of my expertise and late knowledge that Mm -hmm. I've got from my teletype there in the basement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... uh, but I, I don't really dig getting up so terribly early since I'm up so late at night. Yeah, yeah. And when I burn the candle at both ends, I really start dragging. Now, was it a few years ago when we had a lot of heavy rains? Uh, oh, good heavens. I thought of a... that today. <laughs> but the real estate people in Glenview wish that I wouldn't bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I had a flashback to that June Saturday. It was a Saturday in June uh-huh. uh, on the 10th in 1967. And I was over at Golf Mill Shopping Center. Mm-hmm. And uh, some store was having an open house. And I never saw the sky get so dark, oh, good heavens, for the middle of the day, except maybe a total solar Mm -hmm. eclipse. And the rain, it came down in torrents. And um, I get home, and it was already up to the first step in my basement. It had smashed the windows. This wall Mm -hmm. of water had come rolling down through part of Glenview, where there used to be an old slough and an old branch of the Chicago River. And, you know, lots of of the north suburban area got flooded that weekend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it hasn't rained that much in such a short time since then, which would be just six years ago. And I had seven feet of water in my basement. People thought, you know, that I meant seven inches. Mm Mm-hmm. But no, in fact, <laughs> if my ceiling had been higher than seven feet, I'd have had more water. <laughs> Do you think that many people felt that was like poetic justice, that the weatherman oh. have a basement filled I with water? I'm sure a few mean-minded people <laughs> might have had thoughts of that nature. What, what, <laughs> what kind of hate mail do you get? Well, you mean when, rather than drop dead or... No, well, I, I shouldn't call it hate mail. I should say when, when you're <clears throat> predicting bad weather, and we get bad weather, you know, they blame it on you. Well, sometimes it's very short. It's like that forecast that the weatherman <laughs> gave, uh, like, you stink. That's all it's written on the card, you know? Uh, I remember the first card I got when I came to Chicago, though, uh, in 59. We mentioned that I came then. Mm-hmm. It was a heat. It was a hot August of 59. And a card saying, change the weather or we'll send you back to where you came from. Signed, the syndicate. <laughs> and there was a gorgeous bouquet of flowers on the uh, outside, you know. <laughs> that was my first boutonniere. <laughs> oh, hey, that's right, boutonniere. Yeah. You've been getting the flowers. So I changed the weather right away, and since then I haven't been able to stop it from changing. Mm-hmm. Get them, uh, give them a weather forecast they can't refuse. You know, this uh, weatherman that I used to listen to in Boston, uh, I used to uh, feel so sorry for him because people uh, would say, oh, he's wrong all the time, and uh, these weathermen... 
And I used to listen closely to all his excuses. And I have a big book now that I read every day. <laughs> what did Rideout say when they said he doesn't know what he's talking about or he's missed it again? There's one excuse, though, I can't use that he wa uh, used was that it blew out to sea, the storm That's that right. was supposed to come, because the sea is too far away. Too far. Well, we're not far from the blizzard at uh, 79 Wistful Vista, so we'll All get right. back to there for the rest of this good Fibber McGee and Molly program from January 27th of 1942. <laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, yes, Mr. McGee? Look, I, I think the storm's letting up a little. Yeah, so if any of you want to get home before you really get snowed Oh, I in... don't want to go home, Molly. I'm having fun. Yeah, so am I, Mrs. McGee, and I can talk to your husband later. Uh, won't you join us, my dear, uh, when you get through making the sandwiches? <laughs> she wasn't making any sandwiches. Oh, she wasn't? <laughs> No, but I will. I guess Molly McGee can take a hint without being hit in the face with a wet bathing suit. Well, I'll join you guys here. What's playing? plan? Uh, we're playing Thinky Dink. What on earth are Thinky Dink? Well, look, it's my turn. I'll show you. All right. Uh, I'm thinking of a contented insect in an auto robe. I know, I know. A, a snug bug in a chug rug. Oh. <laughs> now, now, your turn, Mr. Selvin. All right. Now, uh, what's a wide-awake quintet in a juke joint? Oh, that's easy. A live five and a jive dive. <laughs> oh, this game is a cinch. Let me try it. Oh, do, Mr. McGee. Go ahead. Okay. I'm thinking of a tired Indian in a borrowed teepee. Give up. A spent gent in a lent tent. <laughs> oh, hey, you didn't give us time to guess, Bibber. Oh, you wouldn't have got it anyway. Go ahead, Molly. It's your turn. All right. I'm thinking of a hand-painted spark plug dancing with a red-haired kangaroo on a Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> Good heavens, I can't think what that would be. Neither can I, so I'll go out and make some sandwiches. <laughs> go ahead and have fun. <laughs> oh, dear, go see who that is, McGee. It may mean extra food and more coffee. Okay, excuse me, folks. Oh, oh sure. Yeah. I don't find out pretty soon what the hell. Oh, Hello, Mr. McGee. <laughs> My goodness, isn't it a terrible night out? Yeah. <laughs> Not that any night out is very terrible to me, though, because, oh, you have company. <laughs> oh, come on in anyway. Hey, folks, here's Wallace Wimple. Hi. Hello, Hello, Mr. Wimple. I don't think Mr. Wimple knows Mr. Selvin, McGee. Mr. Selvin, Mr. Wimple. Uh, good evening, Mr. Wimple. <laughs> oh, it's nothing of the kind, Mr. Selvin. <laughs> it's a horrible evening. I'd never have buzzed out of the house if I hadn't run out of cigarettes. Oh, you don't have to go clear to the cigar store, Wimp. I'll give you a couple of packages. What do you smoke? Uh, q -bed. I didn't know your wife would let you smoke, Mr. Wimple. Well, she doesn't really approve, Mrs. McGee. Not cigarettes, anyway. So she promised me a pipe last Christmas. A uh, briar, Wallace? No, Mr. Wilcox. Lead. <laughs> she, she promised she'd let me have it if she ever caught me smoking again. <laughs> You see, Sweetie Face, uh, Sweetie Face is my wife, Mrs. Selvin. Oh, I see. Sweetie Face is simply obsessed with health fads. Oh. Why, sometimes for dinner, we just have a heaping plate of spinach apiece. Just spinach, Wimp? Just spinach. <laughs> I pretend I don't know she has a silly mignon under hers. <laughs> and... Later, I run out and get a nutty burger. <laughs> oh, but don't you ever protest against such inhuman treatment, Mr. Wimple? Oh, of course I have, Mrs. Uppington. Why, just last Saturday, I said to her, Sweetie Face, I said, I'd like to have a little more freedom. And she said, Why, Wallace, dear, how can you say that? Why, you're as free as a bird. She did, really. Yes. And then she said, In fact, I bet you can fly. And she threw me out the window. <laughs> Your wife sounds like quite a character, Mr. Sweetie Face. Wimple Spellman. His wife's name is Sweetie Face. Oh, excuse me. Well, I wouldn't want anyone to misunderstand me. Sweetie Face is really a delightful person when you really get to know her. She says. <laughs> well, I must be running along, folks. It's been nice to see all of you. Really. Well, 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 you well, sure you well, can't well. stay a while and play some games, Mr. Wimple? Well, if I do it, 
I'd better hit him. <laughs> I'll get one anyway. I'll stay. <laughs> Now, let's all play games again. Now, who was the... Hey, just a minute, folks. Just a minute. What's the matter, matter, McGee? You're welcome to stay all night and play all the games you want, but Mr. Spelvin come here tonight with a message from the governor. I don't want to wait any longer to hear what it is. Well, we'll go in the other room, Faber, and let you talk. No, no, no. Now, we want you all to hear it, don't we, McGee? Huh? Uh, Do we? Why, of course we do. I'm proud of it. Oh, well, I guess we do at that. All you people thought I was kind of unimportant around here, didn't you? Thought I'd never amount to anything. Well, there's going to be a few opinions changed around here tonight. Go ahead, Spelvin, old man. All right, Mr. McGee. Hey, do you realize that your tires wear out twice as fast at 45 miles per hour as they do at 30? Why, certainly we know all of that, but what is Their that... driving habits are hard to control. So what's the best answer? An automatic control, therefore... Hey, what's all this got to do with giving Fibber a state job? Yes, why does the governor need our car? Now, that's what I've been getting at. Huh? It isn't so much that the governor needs your car as it is that your car needs a governor. <laughs> hey, what is this, bud? Who do you represent? Well, you never let me quite explain that, Mr. McGee. I represent the Governor and Carburetor Corporation of New Jersey. Oh, right. <laughs> oh sure. step into some homes, don't they seem to be more livable and friendly than others? A glow with warm hospitality? A wax-protected home is usually a warm, friendly one. Floors that shimmer and gleam with a rich Johnson's wax polish add beauty to the entire home. They are protected, too, against wear and dirt, actual money-saving protection, and they're so much easier to keep clean. But this Johnson's wax protection and labor-saving doesn't stop with floors. Wax your tabletops, chair arms, woodwork also, and your window sills, Venetian blinds, shelves, refrigerator, shoes, luggage, lampshades. Then you'll be practicing what authorities call protective housekeeping. Right now and during the next year or so, it's important to take extra good care of your things. Give them an occasional application of genuine Johnson's wax, which you can buy now in three forms, paste, liquid, and the new cream wax especially formulated for furniture and woodwork. Oh, by the way, Johnson's Wax is great, too, for army boots and leather service equipment. Ladies and gentlemen, this country has a big job ahead of it and won't stop till it's done. We've got to get in there with our money and our work and our loyal 100% support. Yes, Uncle Sam has rolled up his sleeves, and now what he needs is more sleeves. So let's give him our shirts. Good night. Good night, all. This is the National Broadcasting Company. This is Chicago WMAQ. Well, uh, John Holtman. Uh, yeah, I think it was John. John Holtman. Right. He came there in 1937. Recognize a familiar voice. Right away. <laughs> you recognize that station? WMAQ? Yeah, th- that's in the Merchandise Mart. Is that in LaGrange? Mm, no. Oh. <laughs> 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 I remember that place. I'll be there shortly. A little later, fact, with right? Jim Hill out fishing, I've got to go back That's down right. there. That's right. This is one of the first Saturdays that you have to work. Huh? Or yeah, wouldn't you know few? the day you asked me to come over here is the day that I have to go in there too? Yeah. Well, a busy Saturday. Normally, I'm taking it easy, like mowing my lawn or 
Well, you couldn't mow the lawn today anyhow. My son was, you have seen him running around with that mower today, trying to get it finished before the rain hit. In, in between the rain. Our guest, as you recognize, is Harry Volkman, and this is Chuck Shaden on Those Were the Days from WLTD. We're talking about weather today. That was Fibber McGee and Molly and all of their friends in a blizzard back on January 27th of 1942. Say, don't touch that dial. We've got lots of good listening coming up between now and 5 o'clock this afternoon. A couple of good suspense programs using... Uh, the elements uh, in the subject matter. August Heat, starring Ronald Coleman and... Uh, John Coleman? No, Ronald, oh, Ronald Coleman. Coleman. <laughs> and Snow on 66, <laughs> another suspense show. We've got... Remember Saturday mornings? used to listen to the Armstrong Theater. I certainly do. Saturday morning show. Joan Caulfield stars on our Armstrong Theater this afternoon. Thunder and the Miracle. And the Damon Runyon Theater is in, on deck two with The Big Umbrella. Got lots of uh, what do you weather. Mean deck two. What does that um, refer to? Deck two. That's when the second deck of the battleship, or something like that. Oh. <laughs> or of the sinking ship, maybe. Harry, you said uh, before while we were listening to Billy Mills in the orchestra, and you, you mentioned something about listening to our big band show that precedes this one. Mm -hmm. And on the way over, you mentioned the uh, the sounds of the big band era. Oh, and I enjoyed all those records. Gee, they uh, hearing all that music, it it just sends chills down me. Uh, you know, because I, I listen to it all. We we still have a lot of those records back uh -huh. in the house where my brother, one of my brothers and my mother still lives in the Boston area. And uh, now to tie the past in with the present, Chuck, I've got a boy that's playing some of that stuff even, we'll say this very night. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember the old uh, Ted Weems band? Oh, sure. I understand that... Uh, they were pretty famous in Chicago. Oh, indeed. And didn't Perry Como get started with them? Right. He just won $64. Hey, how about <laughs> that? Bob Hawk. Didn't he used to have the 64 Phil Baker. Phil Baker. Bob Hawk had the Lemac show. Now, it's camel spelled oh, backwards. I say, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, then they... Uh, well, anyway, this uh, of course, Ted Weems is gone now, but uh, his drummer at least one of the drummers, named Warren Bills, took over the mm -hmm. orchestra. And he still runs it today, and they travel all over the country. And my son, who's 20 years old, who played with the Triton Jazz Band here a couple of years ago, before that with Maine East, is now uh, one of his main trombonists, and they're playing over in Flint, Michigan this weekend. And uh, he, they have to play, of course, you know, heartaches every uh -huh. now and then, uh -huh. you know. When I think of it, my son... Well, I first, I was hearing heartaches around 1946 a great deal. <laughs> he, that was six years before he was born. <laughs> he, and now he's playing heartaches. Yes, along with a lot of more modern uh -huh. stuff, you know. But uh, when a, it, I don't know when uh, the Warren Bills group comes around or the old Ted Weems band. I don't know whether it brings in mostly over 30s or under 30s. Well, how do they bill it? Do they bill it the uh, Warren Bills with the Ted Weems yeah, orchestra? Yeah, it, you know, it's... You know these things they have in front of the musicians, uh, mm -hmm. the stands or whatever they yeah. call it? I think both names are on there. I forget so you know, he has which the, one is headlined. Yeah, and he has the uh, the Ted Weems arrangements and things like that. A lot of that, yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Does your son, uh, what's his name, first name? Ron. Ron. He yeah, plays does, trombone. Does he like the um, the big band music that they have to play? The, oh, the he, he isn't Weems? sold, I think, too much on it. He's a uh, this generation musician. He likes modern jazz uh -huh. pretty much. Uh, and he'll play it a lot. He uh, had a chance to go with Dick Jurgens not too long ago, mm -hmm. but uh, he decided that he traveled a little bit too much and too far, and he didn't want to get that too far away from Chicago. Mm -hmm. But uh, my son's, of course, his great idol is the, the I think the uh, the premier, or uh, premier, whatever way you pronounce it, uh, trombonist today. Uh, now, what is his name? <laughs> I don't know if you play any of his records here or not, but. Um, Gee, he was down at the London House not too many months ago. Well, uh, you got anyway, me now. I can't think of it either. He's uh, really a great guy. But anyway, that th there's that link from the past, mm -hmm. you know, that comes uh, from those old bands that my brothers and I used to listen to, and uh, some of that music. Now my own son is is playing a lot of it, but carrying mm -hmm. it into uh, a new dimension today. Those programs you used to listen to, um, I remember mostly on Saturday nights was the time. We'd be listening to the National Barn Dance uh, in Chicago, but oh, we, yes. mm -hmm. you could flip around the dial and uh, you'd hear, uh, uh, well, they'd be broadcasting from the Palladium in Hollywood or the uh, roof of the Hotel Astor in New York or from uh, uh, the Meadowbrook 
in New Jersey and things like that. It was really nice to have all of those sounds uh, right there for you. You can listen. Yeah, there are some of the announcers around still working in the business today tell about those remotes that they used to have to yeah. go on all the time from one place to the other downtown. It's an interesting... Uh, I think we're getting somewhat of a revival of that, but uh, I think that the days of the live musician in the studio, it's kind of hard to bring those back except on like something like the Johnny Carson mm -hmm, show or mm -hmm. Dick Cavett. Those are some of the uh, really sought-after jobs by musicians today is to play in studios. Oh, yeah. Well, they become a... Uh, they get a steady job, and there it mm -hmm. is. They're the studio, you know, staff musicians, more or less. A lot of the early staff musicians, the people who were staff musicians for uh, the radio station, you know, back in the 40s, uh, NBC and CBS and ABC all had staff musicians. Yeah, they had, they had something like 50-piece uh, yeah, orchestras. Right. And now, of course, uh, a few of those people are left, and what they're doing mostly is uh, they're the record turners or yeah. the uh, production. There are, right, there's you know. a group that uh, plays regularly, of course, live most every day on Bozo Circus. Mm -hmm. Oh, Bob Trendler. And yeah. I mm -hmm. think N uh, WGN is one of the few, uh, it was the only one in the city, I think, I'm that has a, so. uh, a group of regulars on there. Talking about radio today and weather and forecasting and things like that, this is Chuck Shaden along with Harry Volkman on our Those With a Days program. Harry, do you remember my friend Irma? Very well. Marie Wilson? Marie Wilson. On radio. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, they used to have Professor Kropotkin. And uh, Irma's boyfriend, Al, who used to uh, uh, call up uh, a friend all the time, he'd say, Hello, Joe. Al, got a problem. <laughs> we have a little bit of a sound from my friend Irma right now because that happens to be our cassette tape of the month for the month of June. Let's listen. Look, what, what we're trying to say, Mrs. O'Reilly, is that, well, I, I mean, I, I know that this sounds unbelievable, but every Tuesday night, a ghost in a white sheet has been roaming the hall. Glory be, are you sure? You can ask the maestro, he's seen him too. That's right, that's right, Mrs. O'Reilly. Probably someone who died over a thousand years ago. He keeps coming back to find out what keeps you going. <laughs> Okay, that's just a little bit of my friend Irma on our cassette tape of the month for the month of June. That's Marie Wilson as Irma and Kathy Lewis as Jane. And that's just half of the fun on our cassette for June because on the other side we have a full 30-minute Burns and Allen program. Now, many of our listeners have been getting cassettes of the month and we're pleased to provide this means of beginning or continuing a collection of vintage radio sounds on tape. If you'd like to have this cassette tape of the month for June, my friend Irma and Burns and Allen... George Burns and Gracie Allen, all you have to do is send $4.95 to the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, Illinois, 60053. That's $4.95 to the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Your cassette tape of the month will be rushed on its way to you, and there's no further obligation. If you'd like our tape for July, well, you'll have to listen in July and order again. Nothing is sent automatically. Now, don't forget to get your cassette of the month for June... That's my friend Irma and George Burns and Gracie Allen. Send $4.95 to the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. We'll also include a list of previous cassettes of the month that are still available. And if you'd like to have that list without ordering the cassette, just send a self-addressed stamped envelope to the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Harry Volkman... You said before that you used to listen to uh, WLS and WENR coming through on a clear channel in uh, the New England area. That's right. Did you know, uh, I'm sure you do know, uh, WMAQ and it was then WENR shared studios in the Merchandise Mart. ABC and NBC were together in the Mart and they used the same studios there. I have heard stories from some of the older announcers that... Uh, on some occasions, they'd get up to the station break time, and they'd forget what when they were supposed to say. There was one fellow one night that said, this is WMAQ. No, this is WENR. Uh, no, <laughs> you know, he went back and forth several times, and uh, I forget the final outcome of it, but uh, it was accompanied by a little bit of uh, explosive... Uh, strong word, you know, as <laughs> he finally gave up trying to figure out what break he was supposed to give. Well, see, that followed the break of the Red and the Blue Network, yes. which the National Broadcasting Company, they had the two networks, and then they were, the government said you have to divide yes. them. Yes. You know, the big map 
for the Blue Network affiliates, mm -hmm. where the old NBC mic is still on the wall down there. It is. And that big old master control room of the Blue Network, mm -hmm. uh, there's on the 19th floor, and it's the uh, control room now that we use for uh, getting all the cameras set up just mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. In other words, an engineer sits in there and adjusts the picture so that it comes over your set at home, just the right mm -hmm. shading, uh, right light, and all that kind of stuff and contrast. How much preparation do you have to do for a, um, uh, a weather cast? Uh, for well, the, the ten today, show? Uh, with the new setup where we... Uh, using all the visuals, uh, I have to be preparing about two hours ahead of time mm -hmm. for all of the uh, the visuals to get going. It, it is the period between about one to two hours ahead of showtime that the major amount of work goes into mm -hmm. it. The difficulty these days is getting in some of the last minute information, such as a sudden new radar echo mm -hmm. or and then the latest temperatures. So we can work that out sometimes within the last 10 minutes, mm -hmm. but it, it really rushes everyone because they have to go through so much drawing and photographing and then physically moving the stuff from one studio into the other to, mm -hmm. to get it ready to go on the uh, the cells to project on the screens. Mm -hmm. How many people support you uh, in, uh, very in few. your effort? <laughs> How many do you support? <laughs> I support <laughs> six of the kids, yeah. Yes, that's right. I um, <clears throat> well, I tell you, the there were 150 people in the news department, uh -huh. and 500 at the station. Now, that's a lot of employees wow, when you think yeah, of it. No. NBC down there at the Mart. We don't have, I think, not quite half that here at WLC. Is that right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I would say that um, there are probably uh, in putting my show, that is the part of the show that I'm on. It mm -hmm. probably takes about 20 people. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. From the girl that's taking the phone calls to the to the engineer up in the transmitter, you know, right, straight up and down the line. We have three cameramen on each show. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you've got your engineers that are in the immediate control room area, plus the ones uh, back in what they call Video Central, plus then the the major control room and the transmitter. So mm -hmm. I, I lose track of how many are involved. When you, when you first got involved in it, was the... Uh production of the weather forecast portion of the show uh, as sophisticated as it is now? Wasn't it a little, a little easier, lighter, I should say? You mean in the earliest days yeah. when I did this? Yeah. You know, basically a lot of the things of, of getting the material ready mm -hmm. uh, and preparing it, uh, they're still the same as they were, but now, uh, since I don't draw it myself too much, I do give them a rough sketch, but... Uh, uh, yeah, it really is a lot more sophisticated now, the mm -hmm. preparation of the materials. You know what we found in our hall closet this week? We found the tape recording of the audio track of one of your very early newscasts, or weather forecasts, I oh, should say. Sake. And uh, the sound is a little off on this because your voice comes across a little higher than uh, you're used to. Is that right? But, um, but what we have here is it was one of the very few times when uh, you must have been, obviously, you must have been late to the studio. Oh, never. oh, yeah, this one had to be, and you didn't have the information ready. It wasn't there I can't yet. Imagine you kind that. of fumbled. On. Are we ready with that tape? Let's play it. You still haven't gotten through to the Weather Bureau? Oh, Herb, I've got to get through. What am I going to do? I can't stand out here and stall for five minutes. I mean, this is, this is a weather forecast. I'm on an entertainer. Please, I've only got five seconds. Can you please get through? Can you? Uh, good evening. <laughs> Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to your 1110 uh, <coughs> weather forecast, as it's uh, brought to you every uh, evening at 1110 at the uh, same time. Uh, the uh, <coughs> the present, uh, present temperature is uh, <laughs> degrees, <laughs> and the, uh, the wind is coming from the, uh, well, the wind is coming from... <coughs> The wind is coming from the window, isn't it? <laughs> hey, close that window back there. <laughs> See, it's heated here in the studio, so we have no way of telling actually what the weather is outside. <laughs> well, we have ways. <laughs> you don't have anything yet. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's just take a little look here at the map. <laughs> Florida, and way over here to the west, of course, is California. Let's just pencil that in. <laughs> California there. 
And, of course, you do get uh, varying uh, degrees and temperatures in those different areas. <laughs> I was born right in here. <laughs> that's, uh, that's West Virginia there, and I'll bet it's really cold down there now, Herb. Really cold in West Virginia about now, huh? <laughs> he doesn't know. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I think we are expecting a front end uh, backed up by another front in uh, front of the back there. The, well, actually, this is the front here, and the, the back is the back. That, that reminds me of a little story about this fellow who said to his friend, I understand you're doing very well by your gambling casino. And his friend said, no, the gambling casino is just the front, and the back is a candy store. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a comedian or anything. I do like to get my licks in. <laughs> At least you could do is laugh it up, Herb. Uh, anyway, speaking of weather, as we are here tonight, uh, the other day my little boy was asked by his teacher to spell weather. And he spelled it uh, W-A-N-T-H-E-R. And that's just about the worst spell of weather we've had in a long time. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, uh, can you get me an old report, Herb? Give me an old report. <laughs> Another day. Any day. Any day. Any day. Doesn't matter. Quick. Another. Can I have it? Okay. Thanks, sir. Oh, here's the bulletin, folks. Just came in. Heavy snowfalls are predicted in the Valley Forge area. Two movements have been halted by General Washington. That's not funny. That's not funny. Are you leaving? Are you leaving, Herb? Don't leave. Would you check and see if it's raining? Oh, well, never mind. Well, Fred is still here. Good old Fred. You'll stay with me, won't you, Fred? Uh, anyway, folks, we'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. <laughs> What? No. <laughs> well, we we'll, we seem to no longer have a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I remember that show. Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> that, of course, was Don Knotts, and he's in town, as a matter of fact, starring out at the Arlington Park Theater in. Uh, what is the name of that show? I can't think of it. Uh, the Mind with the uh, Dirty Man or something? The Mind with the I think the he's getting man. more material for his shows by watching me uh, <laughs> <laughs> for future recordings. <laughs> what was your most embarrassing weather experience, Harry? I tell you, I've been through a lot of those things that he's saying. I've uh, sometimes been out there and we didn't get the temperatures, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we predicted rain or said it was going to. And someone brought in a message saying it's already raining. There are all mm -hmm. sorts of things like this that make you want to become a janitor or something or <laughs> get out of the weather business like many of the fellows that went to school with me did. Uh, one night they pulled a real stunt on me. They said, we're going to have a very serious presentation now to show some RCA engineers about uh, how you can use the weather to uh, you know, all these different colors on the maps and the dials and things. So they said, now, just do a normal three or four minute presentation don't try to ham it up or anything just be yourself so I went out there and uh, this was the day when I had boards that I turned and I started to turn the first board and it got stuck little did I know that the stagehands had been told to stuff a cloth back mm -hmm. there so that the thing wouldn't move anymore <laughs> and I thought well uh, weather stuck a little bit here tonight so I went on over to the dials which I had at those days too uh -huh. and uh, hoping that the, engine, the uh, stage crew would pull the cloth or whatever was sticking the map uh, out of there. So I'd go to the dials, and the first thing i go to is the temperature. And just as I'd point to it, the thing comes flying out at me. It was on springs. <laughs> it was like a, a serpent's head or uh, something. <laughs> and it had a canister uh, of high-pressure carbon dioxide. And it went... <laughs> doing, you know, comes flying. And I jumped right up off the floor about a foot. It scared the life out of me. And then I began to realize that someone was pulling a joke on me. And uh, we put a lot of this stuff together to, for an Emmy show presentation mm -hmm. several years ago. But they had the light go out on Alex Dreyer mm -hmm. and uh, had a phone ring beside his desk. And Alex says, well, we've paid the uh, telephone bill, but I'm not so sure about the light bill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'd had a lot of fun with those things of that nature. But uh, 
It it is embarrassing sometimes. I used to have to introduce the announcers uh, who were going to give the commercial, and for a long time I had a spell there where I couldn't remember the announcer's name, and mm -hmm. I'd introduce the the wrong guy, and so invariably they'd come back and say, "Now back to Charlie for more weather." Or something <laughs> like that. Get even with you. Yeah. So uh, those early days of uh, live TV, I think that we got away from them too far, and. Uh, part of the success, say, of the uh, the Channel 7 news team and, and the the whole thing that's going on today is beginning to get a little more relaxed and having a little mm -hmm. more fun with it again, which we've been attempting again to reestablish on 5. But it's mm -hmm. a little hard for us to do because we've been holding the line of being a little more serious. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our audience that watches us say, say we don't want you to be too silly and too stupid mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. And so you're battling within you. What do they want you to do? What do you like to do? What does the management want? And uh, it's a thing that keeps you awake some nights. You know, it is the news on television, the news programs <clears throat> such as yours and uh, uh, on the other stations. That's the only remaining live television That's today. Right. Everything like else that. is on tape or on uh, That's right. film. Yes, uh, fortunately, mm -hmm. we'll never be able, uh, never get to that point where it will be wise to tape it because things mm -hmm. are happening right up to yeah, the last right. minute. That's good. You know. Yes, it is. I, I don't think I could stand to work in the kind of TV where you'd work all day doing a one-minute commercial. Because mm -hmm. uh, I guess the residuals are pretty well. You can <laughs> lie on the beach at uh, Jamaica somewhere and say, my commercials are running back in the States now. Mm -hmm. The checks are rolling yeah, in now. Yeah, stuff like that. I'd rather be right there and do it and know that when I'm seeing it or showing it, that it's coming into the home sets right at that time. It has an air of immediacy and importance. I think that uh, that that holds true even in in uh, radio. I've occasionally, I've uh, had to tape a thing for the use on the air here, and I'm never as comfortable taping something as I am when I'm doing it live. And I know that uh, uh, I never, they're out there listening. You're out there now listening to what we're right. doing, and you can you know react immediately to you something. You get yourself psyched <laughs> into the uh, the feeling that it's not real mm -hmm. unless it's on right now. Yeah. Now, there are some, uh, like the people who are in the acting line, they know they have to rehearse, mm -hmm. and they don't want to go on till they know it's ready to be done. And that's a, a different kind of uh, person that does that kind of thing. I, I don't know as I could be successful doing that business. I'd rather be live. You know, you watch the uh, the Carson Show or Cabot or any of these programs. Now, they're they're taped, for the most part, from start to finish, and it's presented live, uh, except that it's on tape, and they bleep something here and there. And I do have the feeling that that is as immediate as I'm going to get on television. But when I see a variety show, uh, Dean Martin maybe, or Julie Andrews or whomever, and they use the special uh, tricks, you know, the photography tricks, mm -hmm. they make a nice mm -hmm. slick production, but I feel I'm being cheated. I, I, I feel ah, it's all been done uh, months ago and in a cutting room someplace. Well, you I know what that immediacy. Uh, the singers today do, and I guess they're they are performing on television. Mm -hmm. They'll go through their choreography, and then later on they make the tape of the voice. And this is what they did with me on the Emmy show a few years ago. And I, I just couldn't bear the thought of doing it that way. Is that I want to sing it while mm -hmm. I'm out here mm -hmm. going through the motions? They say, well, it's it's hard to get the kind of quality we want, you know. But I, I guess this is the way it's done today. You make the, the voice track at another time. But, you know, I, I, I don't know. I have never been fooled by what they call the lip sync, you know, where the, the actor or the singer is mouthing it, mm -hmm. and the, you know they've pre-recorded it. You know it's coming in there. And I, I always know that they're, they're faking it like that. And, eh, baloney, you know. <laughs> I'd rather have a little less sound quality and know that they're doing it right then. Well, I think that's important. You know, it, it's like a lot of the country is today. You know, it used to be considered uh, bad business to charge anything, mm. to buy any food that was canned, or to have records. Now, you know, we we, we just a lot of us do that thing without thinking anything about it. You know, it's it's what gets over, what makes money, what looks good. You know, it doesn't have to be real. Unfortunately, that that's what leads to <laughs> a lot of the underhanded dealings that happen mm. in. Our, Mm -hmm. country in our society today, I think. So we, t I think we're beginning to, re to go back to the more real things, and our young people are leading us in that direction. And that's my sermon for today. <laughs> <laughs> Sermonette by Harry Volkman. Say the old clock up on the studio wall says, you got to duck out of here. You're going over to uh, that television station. What is channel between 4 and 6? It's 
Four point three. Four point uh, five. I think it <laughs> it's is. It's channel five or so, right? Yes, I'd Did better be on my horse. <laughs> Well, we're going to have you gallop out of the way. We sure appreciate your stopping in with us this afternoon to talk about the weather and about Harry Volkman and share some memories with us. And now, you know, Harry, whenever you do a uh, make a presentation before a group or something like that, they always present you with a, a boutonniere or a corsage. Not a corsage. It was flowers or something like that, and you always hang it up on the... On the weather board, or, your weather, up, yeah. or something like that. You don't. You're not obligated to do this, but uh, in keeping with the tradition of our those were the days uh, programming here, we have gone into the top shelf on the hall closet and I've come out with a Tom Mix Miracle Rider badge for you, Bye. and you can yeah, wear that. <laughs> miracle Rider, Tom Mix. I'll go home and have some Ralston right now. Too. Right. You're one of the sharpest shooters around. We sure appreciate your being with us. Well, Chuck, it's been a great pleasure being with you. Thank you, Harry Volkman. It's always fair weather when you're around. Thank you. I hope to be with you again.